Work and potential energy. Why work? Well, besides getting something done, work tells us the difference between these two situations. With just F equals MA or Newton's second law in our arsenal, the, we can't really tell the difference between these two cases. In other words, just standing here holding a box, you're applying that average force, uh, the weight of the boxes, the weight of the box, and you would still be applying that same force when you were lifting the box. So F equals MA can't tell us the difference between lifting and just holding a box. So we need this idea of work. You see, when this person's just holding the box, no work is being done. Yes, they're putting out an effort, but they're, they are not doing any work according to our physics definition of work. However, when you're moving the box through a distance here, we're gonna find out that that's exactly the definition of work. It's the average force applied while you're moving an object a particular distance. So again, here is our definition of work. Work is the average force applied over a distance. In formula form right here, work is the average force times the distance. So notice if we have force times distance, our unit is going to be newtons times meters, and that's a unit we call a joule. And a joule is uh, named after James Prescott Joule, who was very influential in uh, equating heat with uh, mechanical energy and therefore led to the conservation of energy. So he is given the recognition uh, for the unit of all work and energy. By the way, joule sounds like jewel, like that. So back to work here. If we take our work formula uh, and we know that the weight of the box is 180 newtons and this person lifts the box 0.8 meters high, then we can calculate the work done being the average force through a distance by multiplying. So if we take 180 newtons times 0.8 meters, we get 144 joules of work that this person did. Another concept that's very important that's associated with work is that work is the area, this area right here, under the force versus distance plot. So in this case, the area would be a rectangle because the force is constant. This person was lifting with 180 newtons of force the whole time, so that is the average force. And then the distance they were lifting was the 0.8 meters. So 180 newtons times 0.8 meters. Notice that that would be base times height here, or the area under this force versus time plot. And we get the exact same answer we did previously using the formula definition of this concept of work. It's always good to have help when you're uh, lifting something, that's for sure. Uh, anyway, let's take a look at another example of both our work equation here, F average times the distance to find work, and also this concept of area under the force versus distance plot to find work. In this case, it's going to be a triangle. So let's look at both of those cases. This time we have the Angry Birds, and we're going to stretch the slingshot with the Angry Bird. 
uh, and get ready to go. Now, once we let go of the Angry Bird, these rubber bands on the uh, slingshot will sling the Angry Bird. Well, when they do, notice that the force when you stretch a slingshot is greatest all, when it's stretched all the way out this distance. And as it starts to uh, contract here, the uh, force will actually die down. So that's what we have happening here. The force is dying down over the distance of this slinging right here, uh, 20 centimeters or 0.2 meters of sling for the slingshot. So the force dies down, and then once the angry bird is leaving right here, there's no more force applied, and it will just follow a parabolic trajectory of a projectile. So anyway, uh, back to our work done. So the force starts out at 40 newtons, and again dies down to zero newtons. It's dying down. So it's not always 40 and it's not always zero. In this case, since it's a linear decrease, the average force will be 20 newtons because half the time the force is above 20 and half the time the force is below 20. If you use a sandbox method, and this was a pile of sand, and you shook the sandbox, you could see that it would level out at 20. If you do your math average, you take the force, the uh, the first force, 40, add it to the second force, 0, and then divide by 2, and you would get 20. So no matter how you cut it, the average force is 20 newtons in this case. So uh, if we use that average force of 20 newtons times a distance that we averaged over of 0.2 meters, we multiply and we get 4 joules of work. And then we can look at our area here. The work is this area. If we have a triangle, the formula for a triangle is base times height divided by 2. So 0.2 times 40 would be equal to 8 joules, but then we have to divide by 2 and we would get 4 joules. So we could also take the area of this triangle, base times height divided by 2, and also get the same answer. <laughs> that wasn't very nice, uh, but I have to admit I wasn't very nice one time when I was uh, demonstrating work to a colleague of mine named Dan. You see, I was telling Dan how if you raised a bowling ball above somebody's foot, and you did work doing that, you lifted the bowling ball in this gravitational field uh, and you, uh, with its weight you lifted a certain distance that the person would become more and more concerned. And the higher you raised it would make them even more concerned. So doing work ended up having quite a bit of meaning. So let's take a look at that work and the meaning that it does have. So what we were doing when we were lifting the bowling ball above Dan's foot here, that we were doing work. And that work uh, was going into something meaningful that we call potential energy. You see, when we raised the bowling ball, Dan knew intuitively that there was a problem if we should ever drop the bowling ball. So while we were lifting it, he became more and more concerned because we were giving it more and more potential energy. So let's start off with our work equation, that work is the average force times a distance, and let's convert that and see how we can get to our new equation for this stuff we call potential energy. So if we go back to Newton's second law, we know that the force we were applying to the bowling ball was its weight, mg, and that was a constant force that we were lifting with. So if we plug mg in for the R average force, and we know that we lift it a particular distance. When we lift things a particular distance, we call that distance height and give it the symbol h. So distance in some of these problems we're going to have in this unit are going to be heights. And so we lifted that bowling ball 1.2 meters above Dan's foot in this particular example. So our equation here for the work that we did goes from F average times d to more specific case of the bowling ball's mass times acceleration due to gravity should we release it times the height that we lifted it 
And that was the big concern for Dan, too. Not only does the bowling ball have a lot of mass, but we raised it pretty high. And uh, so his concern was this quantity, potential energy. We give potential energy the symbol U, and this is a specific kind of potential energy due to gravity, raising an object and changing its position in a gravitational field. So we end up with our equation MGH for potential energy due to gravity. And joules is what it's measured in again. So let's continue on with potential energy and further define it. Uh, notice that when we lifted the bowling ball above Dan's foot, we rearranged its position. And we rearranged that position in a gravitational field. So our definition for potential energy is the energy due to position or arrangement and gives an object the ability to do work. So in this example, the bowling ball when it was on Dan's foot couldn't really do anything, couldn't fall any farther, but now we've rearranged its position in this gravitational field, so if we do let it go, gravity can do work on the bowling ball to accelerate it and cause harm to Dan's foot. So our example of how we would use potential energy in an equation here is potential energy due to gravity, U sub G, is equal to MGH. So the mass of the bowling ball, which is 6 kilograms, we multiply that by the acceleration due to gravity, and then also by the height that it's raised in this gravitational field. And when we multiply all those, two, all those things together, we end up with a potential energy of 71 joules. Dan really shouldn't be concerned about the bowling ball's potential energy. He should be concerned about what happens when I release that potential energy. Well, we'll have to wait uh, until our next video to see what happens uh, to Dan there. Um, but what we just uh, saw in all of these examples was another concept that's super important for you to wrap your head around, and that is the idea that when we did work, in this case lifting the box, or in this case stretching the rubber band uh, and or the rubber band actually being released and uh, flinging the angry bird or when we lifted the bowling ball above Dan's foot in all of those cases when we did work work causes or caused a change in energy the box here when we lifted it now if we let it go could do something when we uh, stretched the rubber band, when we let the rubber bird go here, after stretching the rubber band, the bird can do something. When we uh, lifted the bowling ball, now the bowling ball could do something. So in all of these cases, work caused a change in energy, a change in position or arrangement in all of these cases, so it was potential energy. But this is a big concept that's going to find its way through the rest of our unit. So make sure you kind of wrap your head around that idea of work causing a change in energy. And Scratch's parting thought. And good luck on your quest for continuous improvement.